Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Majestic Mashikasaurus YouTube channel. My name is Milo, and I've talked about Flat Earth a couple of times in the past, but haven't really actually discussed what the idea fundamentally proposes. However, today we're going to be more closely examining the Flat Earth model to see if it really can explain the world we live on any better than the general scientific consensus, which is that the Earth is essentially a sphere in orbit around the Sun. And the way we're going to be doing that in this video is by focusing on two things, the Sun and the Moon. Before we get started, please go ahead and subscribe to the Majestic Mashikasaurus YouTube channel so you'll know exactly when more science videos like this come out. And I'd also encourage you to go ahead and check out my last video on Flat Earth, where I discuss Flat Earth, the burden of proof, and skepticism. Now, without any further ado, let's get started. Day and night. Remember, we're going to be comparing the two competing hypotheses, a sphere versus a flat disk. So let's start with how a globe Earth might explain day and night. Well, first, it makes total sense that a sphere being hit with a light source will only and exactly have half of its surface being illuminated, because once the sun's light reaches past the whitest section of the Earth, it can't just, you know, wrap back around to hit anything on the other side, so that makes sense. This also explains how the sun appears to move across the sky during the day, including sunrise and sunset. At noon, you're right here, so you just look straight up into the sky and you'll be looking at the sun. But if it's sunrise or sunset, you'll be over here. So when you look straight up, the sun will be off to the side. Great, so that seems to hold up. So now let's take a look at the flat earth model. The first distinction to make is that the flat earth model is not a heliocentric one. In other words, the sun is not the center and the earth is not rotating around it. Instead, the sun and moon are about the same size, much smaller than the earth, and both rotating around each other above the flat earth. So because the sun is moving around the disk in circles, it only lights up half the Earth at a time. Or does it? Well, unfortunately, there seems to be a few issues with this. It may have been hard to see in that last visual, but remember that exactly half the Earth is illuminated at one time. A smaller light source orbiting above a flat disk would mean... Well, Professor Dave explains this very succinctly. You've got the sun illuminating half this surface with an arbitrary and rigidly straight line down the middle. How does this work? How does light leave this object and travel one distance to stop here and travel some totally different distance to stop over here? Yeah, so that's an issue. The other thing I'd like to point out here that I've never heard anyone else ask before is if the sun's light does just stop halfway along the disk like that so that the other half of the Earth is in darkness, how does the moon still shine? We know that the moon is essentially just a big rock, and anyone can observe that with their own two eyes and a half-decent telescope. Clearly, the moon does not emit its own light. Instead, the sun's light hits the moon's surface as well as ours, illuminating the moon. But if the sun's light stops shining at that arbitrary halfway line, then it can't reach the moon, in which case that would lead us to believe that the moon emits its own light? Well, clearly not. As I already said, you can clearly look at the moon during the day and see... Well, hold on. Sometimes you can see the moon during the day. How does that make any sense? If we're living on a globe, it's conceivable that the moon could be on the same side as the Earth that's being hit with sunlight, so you could see both in the sky at the same time. However, on this flat Earth model, just as you shouldn't be able to see the sun during nighttime, you shouldn't be able to see the moon during daytime. If you're standing on the side of the Earth that's currently receiving sunlight, and you're able to just look at an angle and see the moon a ways away, then the same has to be true about the side that's currently in darkness. You should be able to see the sun, in which case the sun's light is reaching past that arbitrary divide, and this whole model falls to pieces. So also, how do solar eclipses happen on a flat Earth, for example? A solar eclipse is what happens when the moon lines up right in between the sun and the Earth, causing a temporary shadow to fall upon the Earth as the moon blocks sunlight. Again, this is something that's very easily observable from Earth, and you may have even experienced this yourself. However, if the Sun and Moon are circling around each other and you are never able to see them both at the same time, this should not be possible. But I digress, sorry, we are still talking about day and night. There's one last element to this day and night topic before we move on to the seasons, and that's sunrise and sunset. Like I already explained earlier, this makes total sense on a globe Earth rotating on its axis. However, this simple concept becomes not so simple on a flat Earth, and only works if light does some weird stuff. Another YouTube channel called Flat Out made an amazing computer model of flat Earth to play around with a whole bunch of these different ideas. The link will be 
in the description if you want to watch the whole video, but here's just one segment that's particularly compelling. So everybody living on this line of longitude experiences the sunrise at due east. So in order for that to happen with the sun being right here is we have to have some light bending so that it approaches anybody on this line of longitude simultaneously at an angle that is due east for sunrise. <clears throat> When we look at it from this perspective, we see that the light would have to bend downwards so that it appears like it's on the horizon and not uh, up here um, 3,000 miles high. And so we have to see that along this line of longitude, the light is bending down all across its entire length so that the sun appears from anybody's anybody here their perspective uh, it is sunrise once again in order to make the flat earth model even remotely feasible the light coming from the sun has to work in complete contradiction to everything we know about how light works it has to miraculously bend and inexplicably halt for no apparent reason in order to simply explain how day and night works the seasons all right so flat earth didn't do so well at explaining that last one but let's see how it does when it tries to explain the seasons First, in order to compare the two competing hypotheses, how do scientists explain the seasons on a heliocentric, spherical Earth? Well, it all boils down to the Earth being tilted on its axis as it revolves around the Sun. We know this to be the case because, while it's winter in the northern hemisphere, it's summer in the southern hemisphere, and vice versa. As the Earth orbits the Sun, the direction of its tilted axis remains the same. As you can see in the left side of this image, it shows the Earth near the end of June. There, the northern hemisphere, as marked by above that red line, which is the equator, is receiving the majority of the direct sunlight coming in without much of an angle, making it hotter. But the light hitting the southern hemisphere is coming in much more indirectly. It takes longer to get there, and when it does, it comes in at much greater of an angle, lessening the power of its heat. This is also true as you go especially far north, but because during June the northern hemisphere is tilted in toward the sun's rays, the effect is less dramatic. So when the Earth is on this side of its orbit, it's summer in the northern hemisphere and winter in the south. You'll also notice that this explains why the Arctic has essentially 24-hour days during the summer and Antarctica has 24-hour nights during the winter. Then on the right side of this image, everything is reversed. So now at the end of December, the Earth is on the other side of its orbit around the sun and it's now winter in the north and summer in the south. Great, so that was a little harder to explain verbally than day and night, but hopefully when you're looking at it visualized, you can see it's pretty simple. All right, so how does the flat earth model account for the seasons? It's also pretty simple. They just have the sun moving in a constant circle. Instead, its radius changes throughout the year, getting closer to the northern or southern hemispheres, what they would call closer or farther from the center. So that whichever part of the earth the sun is currently closer to is in summer, the other part is in winter. Unfortunately, again, there's quite a few hidden issues with this. I've come up with a couple problems I have with this idea, and there's also one more that Professor Dave explains in his long response to Flat Earth, link in the description. First, this only makes the problem I was talking about with day and night even worse. Remember how the sunlight would have to arbitrarily know when to suddenly stop at different points in order to only light up half of the Earth at a time? Well, now we know that the sun is actually getting closer and farther from that center line throughout the year but still the light somehow always knows to stop right at that halfway point. So not only does sunlight stretch to arbitrary lengths, but those arbitrary lengths actually change throughout the year and still the light knows exactly when to stop halfway across the earth. We know light doesn't work like that. Second, why does the sun move closer and farther away from that center line like the flat earth model proposes? We can explain the heliocentric model perfectly fine with simply momentum and gravity. But in this weird model where the Earth is flat and the Sun and Moon hover above it, what laws of physics can explain why the Sun and Moon orbit each other, get closer to and farther apart from each other repeatedly throughout the year, and stay hovering at a constant height above the Earth? Similarly, with the magic way that light would have to suddenly stop halfway across the Earth, flat earthers don't have an explanation for how these phenomena could work. Nevertheless, I think there is still some value to be had here, as this is a perfect example of how not to do science. Flat Earthers start with the conclusion that the Earth is flat, and then just make stuff up for how such a system could possibly function, without any explanation for how these details could possibly work, and without any observations or evidence behind them. On that note, there's one more thing I hadn't thought of that Professor Dave explains. 
It's not compatible with observation. Here's why. These are the two tropics. I don't know what you think these circumferences are, but it's safe to say that this one is smaller than this one. If that's the case, one of two things must be true. Option one, this object maneuvers the inner path in a shorter amount of time than it maneuvers the outer path, which would make summer shorter than winter. It's not. Option two, it moves much slower up here and much faster down here so that all of the circles take the same amount of time. That would mean the sun moves through the sky at different speeds throughout the year. It doesn't. So sorry, this model doesn't work. Once again, this model is not backed by any observations, which I believe is kind of like the flat earth motto, right? Get out there and make your own observations. Rather, they're just making stuff up in a desperate attempt to make a flat earth model explain what we see, and I hope I've shown thus far that it just can't. On the flip side, I'd also like to mention that in this video, I focused entirely on what we can observe from Earth. No need to appeal to any photographs from space and get into the whole conspiracy thing. Just taking what we know about the Earth from the perspective of the Earth and comparing two hypotheses that could potentially explain it. And when we do take a look at it with just reason and observable facts, the Flat Earth model still fails miserably. It's not magic, it's science. There's one last very important thing I need to say, but I just want to take a moment and thank you if you're still watching the video. I really do appreciate that you've stuck around this far into the video, and I really hope you've enjoyed it or at least learned something from it. If so, don't forget to like the video and consider subscribing to the Majestic Mashikasaurus YouTube channel for more content like this. Thanks again. All right, there is one last thing I need to address, and that is I understand that a lot of people, as crazy as this might sound initially, actually take great comfort in the idea of a flat earth. Last year, The Guardian made a news video about the growing flat earth community, full link in the description. So here's just two clips from that video where two different flat earthers explain first what they think is the underlying problem with the globe earth lie, and the second who explains what the idea of a flat earth could mean. The reason behind all this deception is they've relegated us to a microbe, a speck of dust in an infinite void with nothing in control. Powerful people who have got more money than us can now say, you do as we say. Of course people are going to want to feel like they're part of something and not so insignificant. You know, that, that makes perfect sense. So yeah, when you, when you realize that and you realize that this world is much more special and you are much more special then yeah, it makes a huge psychological impact, absolutely. Really, I can understand where they're coming from here. When you stop to think about our circumstances, the fact that we are the product of a natural process four billion years in the making on a tiny rock orbiting a pretty small star in an unimaginably fast universe, it's quite easy to feel very small. But small is not necessarily the same as insignificant. You can just as easily find a mindset of wonder about the beauty of our universe and the awe-inspiring nature right here on this little planet, our home. What if, instead of assuming the world is the way we'd like it to be, we'd worked together to honestly try to better understand the world the way it is and how to make our time on it as gratifying, meaningful, and wondrous as possible for all of us. My name is Milo, or the Majestic Mashikasaurus, and if you're new to this channel, please go ahead and subscribe for more content like this. What better time than when we're all stuck at home to spend a little more time on YouTube to learn some cool stuff, right? <laughs> Finally, if there's anything you think I didn't explain very well, didn't mention, or misrepresented here, then please let me know in the comments below. I want to know what is true, so if I'm wrong about something, I want to know. Anyway, thanks again so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I hope to see you in the next one. Peace out.